Hey, science kids. Welcome back to some more science. Science is cool. We are beginning our unit on outer space. We're going to learn all about planets in our solar system. It's going to be so cool. But before we do that, we're going to start right here at home. Because the very first place we went to explore was not a planet in our solar system. It was our own moon. We're going to talk about the journey to get there because it's not so easy to get into outer space. There are three main problems that scientists had to overcome. Now, for this lesson today, I have a helper with me. I have astronaut Wendy because astronaut Wendy has got some really good solutions. Astronaut Wendy's going to tell us how some of these problems got solved. Astronaut Wendy will help us with this lesson. So let's get started. Okay, problem number one. How do we get there? Well, by the time scientists figured out they were really going to the moon, they already had airplanes, but airplanes can't go that high. Airplane engines can take a plane pretty high, but airplane engines need oxygen, air, to burn the fuel to make them go. Well, as we learned in vacuums and pressure unit, up in outer space, it's a vacuum. There is no air. So you can't use an airplane engine. Scientists had to use another kind of engine, a rocket engine. Rocket scientists, those scientists who study rockets, did a lot of experiments. They built a lot of different kind of rockets and they blasted them off and tested them. Not with people at first because they had to make sure they were safe. The first things that got blasted into space were not people, it's animals, bugs, dogs, monkeys. The very first critter to really go up into space was a Russian dog from the USSR named Laika. The United States did a lot of studies using chimpanzees to see if those monkeys could still perform tasks while they were up in space. The first human in space was a Russian man named Yuri Gagarin, and the first American was a man named Alan Shepard. But neither of these people went to the moon. They just went up and then came back down. They did a lot of experiments before they went to the moon. Some of the rockets in the early days before they put people in didn't go so well. Finally, after much experimentation, they got it right. They were able to send people up into space. And the next step was to get them to the moon with a very special, huge rocket. The rocket that ended up taking the astronauts to the moon was called the Saturn V. And it came in stages. This is the Saturn V sitting on the table because it's actually very tall. I can try to stand it up, but let's take a look at it first. And it came in stages because scientists realized that you don't need to take the whole rocket to the moon. This very end, right down here, this is the crew capsule. That's where the people are when you're blasting off. Let's take a closer look at this crew capsule. It's kind of dome shaped. It's got a hatch for getting in and out, and it's got windows for looking out. It's very smooth on the outside. On the bottom, it is sort of roundish. It's got a heat shield, which we'll talk about later. And on the top, there's a docking ring to connect to the rest of the spacecraft and a place for parachutes to come out later on. Inside, there are three couches. The astronauts lay down on these, and that helps during takeoff when there's a lot of force pushing down on them. See, they've got buckles and seat belts too. Underneath the two outer seats, there are beds, which aren't really shown in this picture, so the astronauts can sleep, but there's not really room for them to get up and walk around. It's pretty squishy. Inside this piece here is the lunar lander, and I'll show it to you in a minute, but here's how this works. All of these things get piled together on a launch pad, stacked up like this to launch off together. You've got five big engines on the bottom to get you away from Earth's gravity. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. As soon as you get away from Earth's gravity, this whole piece, which is filled with fuel tanks, uses up their fuel, and this part comes off. There's the fuel five engine, see? It comes apart. The first stage comes apart and falls back into the ocean. You don't need it anymore. The fuel tanks are empty and you can't get more. 
Next stage, second stage, it's a little crooked. That's because I made it. Second stage is this piece right here, also filled with rocket fuel. You're halfway out to the outer space. This is gonna get you the rest of the way. Five big engines get you the rest of the way to outer space. Then when it runs out of fuel, it also comes apart and drops back into the ocean. Stage one and stage two are no longer needed. You have no way to get more fuel for those. Bye bye This is what's left. On the very top of this piece, you have the crew capsule. That's where the people are right now. Once you're finally up into outer space, this piece comes off. The little piece that's going to go to the moon. It turns around. Now you're in outer space, so it probably looks more like this. It goes inside and it plucks out inside here this piece right here, which is your lunar lander. Right now, there's nobody in the lunar lander. It's empty, but it's going to take that lunar lander and these two pieces are now going to go to the moon together. Okay. When you get to the moon, two of the astronauts crawl from the command module, this pointy thing, into the lander. One guy stays behind and I say guy because they were three men at the time. Uh, there have been no women on the moon, but there have been women astronauts. At the time this happened, there were three men. Two of them went into the lunar lander, which they gave the name the Eagle. Eagle because it's the bird of the United States. One person stayed behind. When they're at the moon, this piece lands on the moon. Plop, it goes. It's got a little rocket on it too. That's gonna help it land. The astronauts get out, they do experiments, they're there for about a day, and now it's time to take off again they're not gonna take this whole heavy thing with them. They're only gonna take the part with the people in it. That's the top part. It blasts off and heads back into space where it meets up, ta-da, with this piece. The astronauts get out of the lander and go back into the command module. And this piece now flies home. Once it gets there, all of the rocket fuel in here is gone. They're back at the earth, but how are they gonna land? Well, it turns out that getting back down from outer space is a little easier than getting back up. You're gonna use gravity. So back at Earth, you get rid of this piece, which isn't doing you any good, there's no fuel in it, and you basically have a great big rock falling. The three astronauts in here fell from the sky, and as they fell, the bottom of this ship got super hot. If you rub your hands together really hard, the friction makes your fingers hot, right? So the air friction on this capsule made it very hot. There's a special heat shield here and it flew down through the atmosphere. Once it got low enough, parachutes came out, it slowed the ship down so that it could land in the water. No rocket fuel needed. And they were able to go pick it up with a boat. That was the scientist solution for getting people up into space. And it worked. Good job. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared.
Problem number two, air and pressure. Outer space is a vacuum. There's nothing for me to breathe. I'm going to have to bring all of my air with me. When I get to the moon, if I want to get out, I'm going to need to bring it with me. Now, that's not something new. On Earth, people go scuba diving and they bring air with them. But space is something different. Space is a vacuum. Not only does it not have air, it doesn't have pressure. And if you remember in last week's experiment, when we put the balloon into the vacuum chamber, once we took the air away, the balloon kind of got bigger because there's nothing pushing back on the balloon to keep it in. The same is true for my skin and my eyeballs and other things that are in my body. If I don't have earth conditions here on earth, I'm used to the air pushing on me. When I get to space, that's not the case. It's a vacuum and my skin is gonna have a problem with that. So I need a way to carry pressure with me too. On top of that, super duper cold in space when you're in shadows and it's super, super hot when you're in the sun. And there's a stuff called radiation which can cook my skin the way you get a sunburn. It's the same kind of stuff up there because there's no clouds or atmosphere to block those dangerous sun rays. So I'm gonna need some kind of protection for my body for me to breathe, to keep the temperature right and to make sure that I don't get sick. And so scientists had to make me a special suit that I could wear up in space, a space suit. Let's check it out. So scientists had to make space suits for their astronauts. And the space suits were kind of like having your own little spaceship on your body. They were airtight. This isn't a real suit. You can see my watch and wrist sticking out. On a real suit, all of these things would connect together and there'd be no air leaking out. The spacesuits had tubes running inside with water that would help cool the astronauts down or heat them up. Air would be inside, of course, and the suits were made out of a special material that was super hard to rip and that would protect them from radiation. They had boots, they had gloves, and of course they had a helmet, because you need a helmet in space so that you can breathe. Now, my helmet is just a motorcycle helmet. If this were a real space helmet, it would seal around my neck so the air wouldn't get out. I can put my finger in here now, you can see. If it were a real space helmet, the visor would also be tinted because I can't put sunglasses out when I'm out in space and it is very sunny up there. If it were a real helmet, it would have a microphone inside so that I could talk to the spaceship and to other astronauts. And it would also have a tube that would have some water for me to suck on, like a little straw. It's pretty thirsty work up in space. Astronaut spacesuits are pretty cool. One thing you might be wondering is, how do you go to the bathroom when you're wearing this great big suit? I mean, for those of us in Minnesota, we know how hard it is to go to the bathroom wearing a snowsuit, how you have to take everything off, and it's just a lot of work. This is even harder. Well, funny you should ask, that was the biggest problem. Well, one of the biggest problems in these suits. The little capsule that those 
astronauts were in did not have a toilet. So they had to sort of improvise. Scientists came up for, with a way for the astronauts, the boy astronauts, to pee into these bags. When they had to go number two, they had to catch it themselves and pack it up. Ew. Not only that, scientists back home wanted to study how space affected people. You can tell a lot by what's going on in the stuff that they put out, so to speak. So the astronauts had to take all that stuff back to Earth with them. I'm sure the spacecraft got a little stinky. When they're wearing the big suits outside on the moon, there was no way to do that. So they had to wear a diaper. Oh. Another aspect of space travel that was kind of gross was these people were up there for like a week, three guys, and it was guys at that point, although women have gone into space since then, three guys in a tiny capsule squashed together for about a week, and there's no shower. Yeah. So I'm sure they took sponge baths and stuff, but they couldn't really get out of their clothes. There's no place to really change. I'm sure they were pretty stinky when they got back. No one really talks about that now, do they? Problem number three, food. Well, one thing I know I'm going to need on this trip is some food to eat. Going to be up there a long time. I'm going to be hungry. So I went to the grocery store to see what kind of foods I can get. Let's see here. I bought some of my favorites. Got some cereal. Got some mac and cheese. You should always have fresh fruit. Very good for you. Pineapple. And I got some apples. So these are all some of my favorite things to eat and I wanna bring them up into space. Let's talk to scientist, rocket scientist Wendy and see whether that's gonna be a good idea or a bad idea to bring these things up into space. Okay, let's see what we got here. All right, let's see. Well, you've got a good assortment of foods and that's good because you need to eat healthy while you're up in space but there's a problem with these particular items. Things to keep in mind. You can't go get more food if you run out. There's no Target or Costco up there. You have to make sure you bring enough food for the entire journey. Another thing to keep in mind is you can't weigh too much because you have a weight restriction. Your rocket can only lift so much weight and most of that weight is the people. So you can't have big heavy things like cans or heavy apples and there's no refrigerator so it can't get moldy and we don't want to make a bunch of garbage because we're not just going to open the window and throw the garbage out if we're up in space. Anything we bring up there we have to bring back. So we're trying to minimize the weight, the weight going up and the weight going down. Something large like a can is not going to be a good idea. Also, these bananas, they're already looking kind of bad. Can you imagine what a week of bananas is going to look like? These are going to get moldy. Do you want to eat these bananas? I don't. These apples, same thing. They're going to get all banged around and get gross. Mac and cheese, there's absolutely no stove up there. How are you going to make mac and cheese? That's not going to work. And Rice Krispies, oh, don't even get me started. First of all, we don't have any gravity up there. On Earth, when you pour the Rice Krispies into a bowl, they go down in the bowl and sit there because of the gravity. And the milk you pour on top also goes in there. If you try to pour these up in space, they're going to be all over the place. And the milk is going to make a mess. No, 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 sorry. You can't have these foods. But what astronauts did eat, because they still ate pretty well, they would have a lot of dehydrated packages. So these three bananas right here that are gonna get moldy and are actually pretty heavy, and there's a peel on them. Oh, there's so many problems with this. If you dehydrate them, take the water out, put them in a little package, it's vacuum sealed so they don't get gross. That, this is three bananas, the same as this, but look at, they don't take up any space. And when I'm done with them, I just crumple up this plastic and bring it home. Same with these apples. I have three apples here. They look good now. They're not gonna look so good up in space after a week. But these apple chips, all dehydrated, they'll stay fresh and tasty the whole time and no waste. The other thing I have here 
is some fruit roll-ups. Oh, where it is? There it is. If I take that can of fruit, take a little bit of peaches and blueberries, and I dehydrate them, I turn them into fruit roll-ups, fruit leathers. They don't get molded. Ta-da! This is how we're going to have to eat in space, dehydrated. And anything that's a liquid has to be in a squeeze pouch, like an apple squeezer or a yogurt squeezer. Those are fine, as long as I can put them in my mouth and squeeze them. What I can't do is have anything that needs to be poured. So in summary, yes, you can eat food in space. No, it can't be fresh. No, it can't be cooked. Dehydrated is the way to go. And any liquids have to be in a squeeze bottle or they're gonna end up everywhere. It's tricky to eat in space, but you can do it. You have to. Okay, now that we've solved all their problems, we can send somebody to the moon. Easy peasy, right? No. I mean, yes and no. We did send people to the moon. A lot of people, many missions went to the moon. However, America is the only country that has managed to send people to the moon. It is still very difficult to go to the moon. Other countries have sent robots, but so far only America, Russia, and China have managed to land anything successfully on the moon and come back. Last year, well, a couple years ago, Israel tried to land something on the moon, a little robot, but it crashed. A lot of stuff has actually crashed on the moon. Still, America did land people on the moon. Neil Armstrong was the first person to step foot on the moon. But what did he find there? Let's find out. Hey, Wendy, astronaut Wendy, what's it like on the moon? Tell us. Well, it turns out the moon is pretty dusty and pretty dead. There is nothing growing on the moon. It's gray dust. If you've ever seen a campfire and looked at the ash afterwards, that kind of gray film, fine, like dusty stuff that's left in the fire pit, that's kind of what it looks like on the moon. There's no trees, there's no water, there's no dirt. There isn't even any air. So some other planets that we'll talk about later do have atmosphere, some kind of gases above the planet, but the moon does not. Now, one thing the moon has a lot of, that's craters. A crater is made when a rock from space, a meteor, hits the surface. That high moving rock hits the surface and boom, creates a hole on the planet. All planets in our solar system get hit by rocks, but when you have a place such as the moon where there's no weather, no rain to fill in the little hole, no dirt to fall in there, that hole stays there forever. A lot of little rocks have hit the moon because there's a lot of craters. When you're standing on the earth and you look up, you can see the moon, can't you? Guess what? When you're standing on the moon and you look up, you can see the earth and it's beautiful. Astronauts did find that the moon has gravity, not as much as earth. On the earth, when you walk around, you walk around. But on the moon, it was kind of like walking a little bit on a trampoline when they took a step they jumped a lot farther than they would have on the Earth because of the low gravity. And that's pretty silly. There's some funny movies about that that we should look at right now. One of the things you got to stop and do, make sure they have fun too. Because you're only probably going to come this way once. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. May, May. When they much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Do, 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 do. Boy, is this a neat way to travel. Isn't it great? I like to skip along, but me, boy. Skip. Or whatever you call it. I can't get my left leg in front of me. It's almost dangerous. And you lose sight of the fact that it's a vacuum out there, and if you spring a leak next to it, you're gonna be dead. Uh oh. I like to run up here. <laughs> 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 I feel like Bud's funny. You have to beat me. 
Foxy twin. You're pretty agile there, Twinkle Toes. I'm going out for a ballet when I get back. You learn another line of work up here. Yeah, while you're bouncing around there, you might keep an eye out for a nearby crater. <laughs> <laughs> Storybots. <laughs> It's my time to shine, it's my time to shine, the day is over now, so it's my time to shine. Good evening, it's the moon, here to regale you with the two. I'm so bright up in the sky at night, but the truth is I'm just reflecting light. See, let me help you break it down. The earth and I are spinning around, and I orbit the earth in a loop. You see, the moon is kind of like my hula hoop. We both orbit the sun, he's the big shot. I'm the center of the solar system, I'm so hot. The sun's like a light bulb, and I'm like a mirror. Light bounces off me, and then it appears to the earth below for a lovely view. For animals like wolves who go, oh, Sometimes I'm full, sometimes half on. Sometimes I'm crescent, or it looks like I'm gone. But I'm here in the dark, just a lonely moon. Hoping that somebody will visit me soon. I'm covered in dust and I'm made of rock. So come see me soon and go on a moonwalk. It's my time to shine. It's my time to shine. All that night and at night, we can see the moonshine. It's my time to shine. It's my time to shine. I'm planting this flag on the mountain I climbed. One small step for a story bot. One giant leap for Storybot kind. Science project time. For our science experiment today, we are going to recreate what happens on the moon when a meteor hits. So remember, a meteor is a rock from outer space. There's a lot of rocks in outer space from many different things. When a rock from outer space comes whizzing onto the moon and crashes. Now on Earth, we've got that friction, that atmosphere, the air above our planet that mostly burns up these rocks that come down. So if they do hit, they're usually pretty small. But on the moon, there is no air or atmosphere. So those things come barreling in full speed. And when they hit, they make a crater. The moon is full of craters. They never get erased. There's no weather, no wind, no storms, no rain to fill those craters in like they do on the earth. Cause we do have craters on earth too. We have places where meteors have hit, but on the moon, they are there forever. Some of those craters are huge. If you could climb down into them, you probably will find the rock that actually made the crater. Sometimes that rock might hit so hard it bounces back up, but a lot of times they're still in there and a little tiny rock going really, really fast can make a very big crater. So let's see what happens in our science experiment with our craters. This is a little bit messy, so make sure you're somewhere that you can vacuum up the powder that's gonna be all over the place when you're done with this. You're gonna need for your science moon meteor experiment. You're gonna need a pan to put all your ingredients in, something shallow. I used a pie pan, but you can use a cookie sheet or you can use a brownie pan. You're gonna need the base layer. White flour is awesome because it's super poofy. You're gonna need something to be the rocks and stuff that are in the soil. Sprinkles are great. Uh, try to use the big chunky sprinkles, not the little powdery stuff. Although you could use the powdery stuff if you have nothing else on hand. And something to be the top layer, which is cocoa, which is also very poofy and something to scoop it out with. To sprinkle that cocoa on evenly, a sieve is super helpful. And then you're gonna need something to be your meteors. Some rocks of different sizes. The larger the rock, the bigger the mess it's gonna make. So I chose kind of some medium sized rocks. Let's get started. Okay, to start off with, we have to recreate our moon surface. I'm gonna start by taking some white flour and sprinkling it in my pan. And then I'm gonna shake my pan to make it nice and even, the best I can. Maybe flatten it out a little bit. That's my base layer, okay? Next, I'm gonna sprinkle some of my sprinkles. You can use multicolored. I wouldn't recommend anything too powdery, you won't see it. So maybe some big chunky stuff like that. And my final bit is gonna be the cocoa powder, which is gonna be like our topsoil on the moon. Just like on Earth, 
the ground is made up of different layers of rocks and squash stuff. So there we go, the regolith. Okay? Now we're ready to try our experiment. Okay, now we're ready to drop our rock. The higher you drop it, the bigger crash it's gonna make. A little drop makes a crash, but not much. A bigger drop makes a really big crash. And you can see, here's the crater pattern. And even though the flower was underneath the cocoa, it got kicked up all over the place. In fact, it's even on my table. And that's what happens on the moon too. The stuff underneath gets kicked to the top. And if you look closely, here's the pieces that were underneath. Even the little rocks that were underneath the top stuff got kicked up. So when the astronauts went to the moon, they were collecting a lot of that stuff to see if they could figure out what the moon is really made of. Let's try that with a really tiny rock. Let's try that with a really tiny rock. Plop. Makes a tiny crater. Let's try with a really big rock. Oh man, what a mess. It's all over my floor too, goodness. Wow, that's an awesome crater. Let's watch that again in slow motion. So one thing you see here is the rock is still in the crater. Now I didn't make my regolith, my moon surface very deep. So you could easily see the rock, but on the moon where it's really deep dirt and that meteor hits it, there may be a huge, huge crater. And at the very bottom of that crater, guess what's still there? The rock that made it. The meteor is still in the crater. So who knows where that rock came from? If you got it, maybe it came from outside our universe. That's cool. Going to the moon was super cool, right? The moon is cool. NASA had 17 different Apollo missions. That's the name of the lunar landing missions. The last one was there in 1972, which at the time this video was made was almost 20, uh, 50 years ago, 50 years since we've last been to the moon with people. Now they continue sending robots and other things to check out the moon, but people haven't been there. Good news though, if things go according to plan, people should be going back to the moon by the year 2024, which will probably be a little delayed. It turns out it's hard to get to the moon, but there will hopefully be people on the moon again. If you like learning about the moon and you want to read some more, here are two excellent books that I like. Feel free to check them out from the library. That's all I have this week about our journey to the moon, but don't worry, we are gonna learn all about more planets in the weeks to come. So, have fun! Science is cool!